Well, welcome. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? I know there's going to be some more folks trickling in. This is a new location for us, but really want to thank all of you who, who got here um, so far, and uh, thank you for coming to SACOG today. We were unable to get to our two other rooms that we've been using at SMUD or at City College. and really expect to return to those as we continue the work um, through this year. But, but we did want to welcome everybody to 2012 for the, this project and for the consortium. What, what lies ahead on this project is that we are going to be working on those five case study areas in involving the, co the consortium members in that process. And so watch your emails as we get those uh, those case study areas, the schedule settled for them, as you've probably heard, there's been some changes to, to the redevelopment you know, time frame, and um, that, that's really caused us to, to meet with our members and, and examine how we're going to roll out these, um, these areas and to make sure that there's still the same level of commitment on the projects we were looking at there. But, but all of them are still included is the great news, so uh, we really value your input as we move through that. So today we have a, a great program lined up for you to, to catch you up um, with what's happened since we met last on two of our big projects, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan and the Sustainable Community Strategy. Um, a couple of housekeeping items before we get into the program today. Uh, restrooms are out by the front desk around the corner. Um, we uh, ask that you silence your cell phones as they can interfere with the sound system here in the room. And then for those of you sitting in the back row, if you uh, would like to ask a question, we can actually capture you on, on mic if you hold down that uh, button in front of you on the microphone. Those of you up here, I, I don't think we'll need a microphone for. So uh, thank you for being here. And with that, I'll introduce Matt Carpenter, our Director of Transportation Services here at SACOG, uh, to catch you up on where we're at with the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. And thank you to the consortium members that have been so involved in the Metropolitan Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy. We're moving forward with the effort, and we do anticipate reaching by April um, a board action to adopt the plan. But I wanted to share with you today kind of a brief overview uh, that we have been sharing with each of our counties, um, elected officials, and the public, kind of giving an overview of the plan, both the process and the outcomes we have. And with that, I'm going to um, take just a moment to see if we can get this slideshow up. So in terms of the process, uh, as I mentioned, we're moving towards uh, board adoption we anticipate in April. And as part of that, we're going around the region and we're talking to elected officials and public, um, the public, and, as, and we're getting some good input. We, we have a comment period that closed for the environmental impact report in January that we continue to take comments on the plan. And we're looking at either opportunities where we're going to refine the plan or address some of those comments that may ultimately result in some planning activities we do after um, the board adoption of the plan. Uh, throughout this process, which stretches back over two years, there's been these four really key points of input. There's been the ongoing interaction with our board, um, and then of course there's been ongoing local agency input, both in terms of transportation stakeholders, public works agencies, and transit districts, as well as um, land use planners. And so we've had a very integrated planning process with our local agencies. Similarly, there's been a whole lot of public outreach and stakeholder input, and uh, we certainly appreciate the efforts here at the consortium, and we've had some successful focus groups and workshops that really helped us get a pulse of the public and what are their important uh, planning priorities. And similarly, there's been the ongoing technical analysis. Some of the work that's been funded through our, our sustainable communities grant has gone towards, of course, identifying important performance metrics that we've been using for the planning effort, as well as ongoing analysis of financial constraint and overall plan performance. Um, a couple of just background points that we just provide. I realize with a wide audience, some of you may not be too familiar with um, the, the, the MTP, as we call it, or SCS. And this is what, you know, this, the, the key points to make is that ultimately, it's both an administrative document and a vision document. It's an opportunity, of course, to keep transportation dollars flowing from federal and state sources, but it's also an opportunity for us to step back and look at how do we see our region growing and what are those important transportation projects that we wanna make sure get funded and can move forward. Um, some of the, um, the requirements, as you can see, is that it must be at least 20 years out. And it must, of course, fit within a budget. That's sort of like it's a vision that's rooted in reality. Um, we have to look at just those revenues that are reasonable to assume. 
And we also have the opportunity to update it every four years to acknowledge kind of changes in our projections. What's really new about the, the MTP update cycle this time around is that it also involves a sustainable community strategy. And of course, the, the work here has been very much a support to that. This has been a real opportunity to kind of expand the focus of the plan to analyze more of the land use and transportation connection. Uh, we've spent a considerable amount of time um, with this group and others trying to make sure we can identify those transportation investments that can support blueprint land uses and help the region meet our, our per capita greenhouse gas reduction targets. It's also been an opportunity for the, um, the region to have a deeper analysis through the plan of impacts to land use resources, whether it's ag land preservation or some of the important forestry and other natural resources across our region. The sum of this analysis has led to a much more comprehensive environmental impact report. Um, and by doing this more robust analysis, um, we, we have, you know, we, have, we believe we're going to be reaching some of the opportunities to unlock some of the potentials through Senate Bill 375 for environmental streamlining. Uh, these are just the kind of the nuts and bolts of the four core elements to the plan, um, ranging from a project list of transportation projects in a budget to a land use allocation. How do we think we will grow out to the horizon year 2035? And of course, looking at performance outcomes, does the sum of the investments in land use strategies result in a region that increases and improves the quality of life? And what are those implementation steps, whether they're policies and strategies, in order to realize the vision of the plan? The next few slides basically cover some of the key foundation elements to the, the MTP SCS. Um, one of these key foundations is really balancing six principles that the plan strives to achieve. Um, of course, the, the challenge we have when we look out to our horizon here is how much change we anticipate in the region. We expect growing more than 900,000 new people, and the character of that growth will also change. We anticipate that over 70% of the new households will be of uh, 55 years of age or older. Um, what this sets up then, of course, is that kind of need to balance, need to balance the idea of protecting valuable agricultural lands with trying to find opportunities to put housing and other um, amenities near employment centers. And so that's really what the plan is trying to do, is trying to achieve that balance. And of course, some of the work we've funded, if it's being funded through our sustainable communities grant, is trying to get to that very objective of balance. Another key kind of foundation element for the MTP SES is looking at the region's future in terms of community types. Uh, essentially, community types are, are really a, an important way or a better way to understand the unique character of the various parts of our region. Uh, what you see there illustrated are the five um, key community types. Uh, the darkest red is what we call centers and corridor communities, and each of the, the 22 cities in our region has a, a, either a small or larger downtown that's considered a, a center and of course there are of course many important corridors that are you know places where there's a higher amount of compact mixed use development these are existing parts of, of our current um, urban area uh, immediately adjacent to the centers and corridors is what we call established communities and these are of course built out areas generally around the centers and corridors and then further afield that's illustrated in the gray is um, what we use kind of the grayish purple established communities and these include some of the growth areas we anticipate whether it's in southeast sacramento county or uh, growth areas in west roseville or other parts of the region also illustrated there you see in yellow rural residential communities now by no means are everything in yellow um, rural residential but this is just these are the areas where there are large lot single family homes that uh, comprise much of that that, that belt along the foothills and then similarly, uh, the area that's just in green are, is an area that we anticipate would be remaining, would not be a, have any development by the horizon year 2035. These are lands protected either for agriculture or for natural resources. Another really kind of key kind of foundation element to the MTP SCS is essentially how to make more with less. Um, this is that truly the, the, the challenge of this plan cycle because with slower growth that we projected, um, that will not only be a reflection of the recent recession, but the, a slow recovery from it, there comes less transportation revenues. And as a result, there's been a real focus in this plan cycle to focus on right sizing, essentially looking at um, how can we make these projects fit within the budget while not compromising good cost benefit or performance outcomes. One of the key strategies to achieve that outcome, of course, has been better integrating our transportation land use planning. Um, this is through 
the MCT SCS work to kind of look at both how do we look to have a region that quality of life improves through economic vitality, which is of course the topic of the next portion of today's meeting, but balancing with that natural resource kind of conservation principles. The total for the, the out to 2035, we anticipate to be spending is just over 35 billion across the region. Now this reflects all transportation dollars, whether they're local, state, or federal coming to the region, of which only a small sliver is actually controlled here at SACOG, but this is the sum of those decisions, whether it's your local government or here at SACOG for the state of California. And now I'm just going to cover, uh, these are essentially the elements of that total $35 billion that we expect to come to our region. These are the primary investment categories. Uh, the, the largest investment we anticipate over the planet horizon is towards maintenance and rehabilitation efforts. And one of the clear policy directions we received from our board was an interest in raising uh, the region to more towards a state of good repair, essentially finding a way that whether it's commitments are, that are being funded to improve the Caltrans highways and freeways or an urban local and rural streets, uh, trying to make sure that we can find a way to improve the maintenance and rehabilitation that is so often um, neglected in our region. Um, the challenge, of course, is the, the source of the revenue for these projects. We, you know, we, although we've made progress with the MTP SCS, we recognize that this is an ongoing challenge and only with new sources of funding will be able to truly achieve the outcome that we want in terms of getting us to an excellent state. Also, a second and related category is the investment we have in road capital and operations. Um, there's a much higher emphasis in this plan update on operational improvements Recognizing the constraints we have financially with being able to fund capacity projects, there's much more of an effort in this plan to look at technology, looking at intelligent transportation systems that can either offer information for the traveler that helps them better optimize their trip, or to focus on smaller cost improvements, whether it's improvements in an intersection or interchange that helps traffic move and buses move more efficiently without the cost for more expensive capacity projects. Another key investment category is public transit. And this 11.3 billion we anticipate the region to spend is really a balance of it. Just over two thirds would go to just the operation of those, of those buses and, and rail vehicles. And the balance, the other third essentially, to vehicles, um, whether they're bus or rail, um, the newer expanded vehicles. We, we do have a, in the plan, of course, this total allows us to increase both the coverage and the frequency of transit across the region significantly. But there's a real focus here on looking at those activity centers, those, and some of which are the activity centers that are the subject of this, our Sustainable Communities Grant. Look at those transit-oriented development areas and making sure that the highest quality transit serves those areas with the most productive, I mean, the most productive uh, uh, transit services go to those areas with supportive land uses. And essentially, in, in the MTP budget, there's a real reflection of the fact that for the next 10 years, we expect to just basically be recovering to where we were before the recession. But as more of the blueprint land uses come online in the latter half of the planning period, the final 15 years, a real opportunity to accelerate the amount of, of transit. What it results in in the region is a region where today, just over 15% of all uh, transit lines are at the frequency of 15 minutes or, or, or more. But by the horizon year, we expect that to percentage to increase to 45%, or nearly half of the bus routes or rail lines would be at 15 minutes or, or better. And that, of course, would allow for more choice riders to consider taking transit for their travel. Another area um, where there's a significant focus in the, in the plan is in terms of bicycle or pedestrian investments, kind of active transportation. This is the highest per capita increase of investment in the, in the plan. And it is really this opportunity to focus on completing streets, looking at more connectivity that is both a reflection of how do we get to that, for that final mile to a transit stop, or just making sure that people that can consider for some of their short trips an opportunity to walk or bike, that they have the infrastructure there to support that. And then a final category is, is basically kind of a catch-all. This really reflects a lot of the efforts we've been working on with consortium and other groups in terms of blueprint implementation. This is a wide range of investments that ranges from everything from the 511 traveler information and safety improvements to community design program. The community design program, of course, is this opportunity to provide catalyst funds, uh, public dollars, to, sort of, to incentivize smart growth land uses around transit um, areas. It also includes air quality programs and other supportive investments. 
Now, we've been talking largely about inputs or the investment kind of profile for the draft plan. I now want to just kind of cover in terms of outcomes a little bit of the, the key findings we have about the transportation and the land use and environment. One of the, the, the really important outcomes that we've identified through the planning process is this opportunity for the balance of transportation and land use strategies allows us to actually tackle the congestion issue. Um, as you can see from this graph, which illustrates progress over the last two plan cycles, um, what we're seeing is in terms of per capita vehicle miles of travel and congestion actually reducing through this plan. And that's a combination of land uses that you know, support shorter trips as well as the strategic investment at bottlenecks, whether they're you know, congestion interchanges or finding operational improvements or offering new mobility options. There's also an important outcome here in terms of this idea of making more with less about finding a more efficient use of existing roads. We really, by focusing on a lot of these operational strategies, the real goal here is to find, you know, make sure we can get more productivity about right, the roads we have versus building more capacity. And so the time and money that we save through this, this kind of focused effort has allowed, of course, some of the budget in that in later years to be anticipated to be spent on more maintenance and rehabilitation activities as well as other purposes. Another key transportation outcome, uh, which relates to efforts that this group has been involved with around transit-oriented development, is finding a way to improve access to job centers. Um, what the, 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 the draft plan provides is an improvement in those areas that are reachable, the percentage of people that can reach a, an important job center, whether it's downtown Sacramento or South Placer or Rancho Cordova, within 30 minutes, whether they're driving or taking transit. So real focus on how do we unlock the potential of these these activity centers to be places that you can live and work and get to efficiently. Another key transportation outcome is just in terms of transit productivity. Um, by matching transit corridors, excuse me, matching transit corridors with supportive land uses that can attract riders, there's a real opportunity here to, to see every dollar spent on improving transit to, to yield much you know, better productivity. More folks riding those buses, more folks in the light rail vehicles, and as I mentioned, that, of course, that corresponds with being able to increase the frequency on many routes. So we're able to not only serve the transit dependent, but also to expand travel options to the choice rider, whether it's through express bus services, light rail travel, or uh, bus rapid transit. There's also a, a kind of a corollary to this, of course, is that by focusing on transit supportive land uses where we put the service, there's an opportunity for more of the cost of transit to shift to the, to the, the rider. And so today, across our region, there's an average of about 24% of the cost of running a, a typical bus or rail vehicle um, is covered by the fare. But by the horizon, we anticipate that 24% to, to improve to 38% of the total cost. So the public subsidy declines. Now, I just want to hit a couple of important points in terms of outcomes on the land use and environmental side. Um, what this illustrates is that, remember the slide about the, uh, the five community types areas, the, the real message here is the fact that we really focus the growth on those areas that are urbanizing in our region. Those, the idea of trying to find a better balance between jobs and housing and centers and corridor communities, looking for opportunities in established communities that may be more housing-centered to improve the, their share of jobs, so again, the jobs housing balance improves. And the, although there is still significant growth in developing communities, there's really this emphasis on those on the centers and quarters and established communities to absorb a higher share than they have um, most recently. And then, of course, the rural residential area, although there is some modest growth in the plan, it's, as you can see, a very small fraction of the growth we anticipate. Although, um, although the growth you know, is focused uh, across those three kind of the urban categories. You can see what this illustrates is that housing choice and options remains kind of broad and that there is those four different types of housing um, still seen in, the, in the, the future of the region, but that the, the, the focus or the emphasis changes dramatically depending on the community type. Um, with centers and corridors, of course, naturally these are places with high amenities with good access to jobs or Strong transit have the much higher share of attached housing and in, in contrast to a developing community, which you still see a significant amount of large lot, but with that a balance of small lot and some more attached. One of the results of focusing the growth on these, uh, you know, on, on existing urban areas 
and, and, and looking for a way to reduce the urban footprint increase is that it really has this very positive output in terms of reducing the impacts on farmland. What this it just points out is that from the period from 1988 to 2005, we were taking up a considerable amount of farmland, and that despite the increase of more than 900,000 people we expect over the, the planning period of 2035, that reduces just 42 acres by looking at ways to better integrate our transportation land use choices. Another important outcome environmentally is just, of course, that we meet um, our federal air quality requirements. We're on the path to stay within our, our budgets we have for air quality attainment, and that we do expect that this coordinated approach is a way to make sure that we can achieve that important outcome across the region. And then, of course, um, the opportunity through looking at integrated transportation land use planning to meet our greenhouse gas reduction targets, both for the horizon year 2020 as well as um, the interim year 2020 as well as the ultimate year in 2035. By achieving this, these targets we've set, we have a sustainable community strategy that has the real potential to offer an important benefit um, for uh, projects across the region, and that's in terms of streamlining. Uh, what we've done, as I mentioned, is that there's been a much deeper analysis of, of, of resources uh, in terms of land uses impacts in the region through the environmental impact report we did at the regional scale. Um, it has pretty limited impacts to transportation, air quality, energy, and greenhouse gases. And there's a real opportunity for agencies that take, the local agencies, subsequent environmental documents that, that take the analysis and the mitigation measures to be able to tear off of that. And so we see that as saving some time and money in terms of their subsequent environmental analysis. There's also an opportunity in terms of going even further with the environmental benefits, the streamlining benefits for those, pro those projects that are in transit priority areas, um, mixed use or residential components that are consistent with the sustainable community strategy have a real shortcut in terms of their environmental process um, for those transit priority areas. Um, and it's, as I know this group has been working on very much looking at those areas. So in terms of process or where we're at, as I mentioned, that this is sort of an overview show that we've been taking out and talking about um, the plan with our elected officials across the region. We continue this effort right now to, to look at plan comments and to finalize the plan. And we anticipate after uh, board adoption in April that we'll be able to move forward with you and others in terms of plan implementation. So that's sort of just sort of broad scan of where, you know, where we're at in the process as well as some of the highlights of the plan. I'd certainly welcome any, any questions or comments you may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Matt. And uh, questions and comments, the, the period is open through the plan adoption. What we are um, addressing many comments we have received in the planning process. So, so the other uh, big piece of our program today is, is, is on the next economy project. And many of you have heard about this project um, that, that was started by the private sector as um, really kind of a parallel effort to the work we're doing for the regional economic development strategy. But this is really the first time that we've had the, the private sector lead the effort in this in this region and working uh, with Valley Vision and uh, other groups that Bill will describe in a moment. We, we are, are developing a regional strategy that, that can work in partnership with, with what we're hoping we uncover in the, that, these uh, case study sites, which is community development strategies where we'll, we'll be working with the communities in these five case study areas to, to see what, what types of community development projects they are interested in. And there will be interaction in these two processes as, as we move forward. So, so uh, with that, I'll introduce Bill Mueller from Valley Vision, who will uh, introduce our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How are you? So, uh, uh, as Joe mentioned, my name is Bill Mueller. I'm the CEO of Valley Vision. We're uh, uh, a regional organization that does uh, uh, civic leadership and regional economic development work. Um, we've been around for, for many years um, and uh, pleased to be a partner with uh, SACONG on the sustainable community strategy. Um, so what we have in mind is um, uh, we want to give you a, a bit of a background on Next Economy. So there's a bit of a, a presentation that I'd like to share with you. Um, to update you on the planning effort and what's behind it and sort of where we're going. 
And then I have uh, with me uh, uh, true sort of experts, people that are working on the front lines uh, relative to Next Economy. Um, and uh, joining us today are Jim Williams. Jim Williams is a principal with uh, Williams and Patton uh, Architects and Planners. Um, he is a, a very successful businessman and uh, uh, had the um, uh, had the experience of being a county supervisor in Placer County, um, so also a public servant. And uh, during his time, uh, had the, uh, the the continued um, uh, benefit of being part of SACOG um, and a representative there, uh, including through the blueprint process. It's my understanding. Uh, the initiation. The initiation of it. Okay, so uh, Jim is one of the leadership uh, members. Uh, we have six members. We'll talk about that just in a minute, but he is one of the, the leaders of that effort. Um, to his right is Christine Alt. Christine is a, uh, an amazing uh, communications and uh, project management uh, professional. Uh, she worked for the Sacramento Metro Chamber for a number of years as, uh, in a senior executive position. Um, she is the staff manager, the day-to-day -day manager of Next Economy, and so she'll be here to, to talk to us uh, and answer your questions. And then to her right is uh, Martha Lochran. Martha Lochran is currently uh, uh, the chair of Valley Vision. Um, she was formerly the interim chair of the Sacramento Metro Chamber, where she served as uh, CEO and president for eight months, uh, uh, seven months. Um, and uh, she is uh, a very experienced attorney, both in the private sector, but also in the public sector. She was the Folsom city manager for a number of years and, and the city attorney before that. Um, very well versed in legal matters, but also works uh, uh, extensively with the business community and the environmental community uh, to find uh, answers. So um, I wanna thank uh, everyone for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us and to be able to talk a little bit about this effort. I wanted to also mention that uh, Martha, uh, together with Jim, are one of, uh, uh, one of the six uh, leadership members um, as part of this effort. So with that, what we envision again is, is uh, uh, I'll give a brief presentation. I have uh, two or three questions that I think will sort of seed the conversation uh, with uh, uh, with uh, Jim, Christine, and Martha, and then we want to open it up to you and uh, so that you have uh, questions and be able to field those. And this whole thing should probably take about uh, 45 minutes or so is our hope, okay? So I have the clicker, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the presentation. And do I need to stay tethered here or can I roam around a little bit? I can roam, so thanks AJ. All right, so that's good. So uh, as far as a preview, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about economic and political conditions that are driving this, who's at the table, what we want to do, um, what will result, uh, why we think it'll work, and how we need your help, um, those of you here in the audience, in order to make this happen. So um, how did we get here? Uh, I think people might have seen the statistic before, but we know through economic research we have lost 145,000 jobs since the peak uh, of the economy in 2007. We currently have about 11% unemployment versus 8.5% nationally. And you may know that there are metropolitan regions in the United States, actually 372 of them. Right now, the Sacramento region is ranked 337 in terms of unemployment. So it's fair to say that, that our economy is not only lagging in California, but it's also lagging the United States. Um, another important statistic is that um, we have a very large economy in the Sacramento region. It is 32nd out of those 372 in terms of gross metropolitan product. It's a $93 billion economy, so it's quite large. But in terms of growth, that is, you know, uh, it's production of, of wealth and job creation. We're currently 345th out of 372. So, so um, uh, these are sort of the, the facts that um, sort of were the catalyst behind Next Economy. Uh, most economists uh, indicate that a regional recovery is years away. Most say 2015, 2016 to do a, a full recovery of those 145,000 jobs. And there's a belief 
that waiting for political leaders in Washington, D.C. or our state capitol, as great as they are, um, <laughs> as I look to one of our representatives, um, that, that more than likely it's going to be a long wait for us in the Sacramento region. Uh, we're, we're hopeful that, that that is not the case, but we feel as though we need to take ownership for this situation and do something about it ourselves as a, as a community uh, of, uh, of citizens. We also believe that there's discord at the state capitol on, on where that leadership is going to come. And so it sort of creates um, this demand for um, some sort of action to happen. And we've looked you know, to Washington, D.C. and these other locations. And at the end of the day, it's probably going to be us that we need to look to to actually get something done. So that's really the genesis of Next Economy. So uh, we have three large regional organizations that are focused on economic development, different aspects of it, and they work in close partnership. The Sacramento Metro Chamber is uh, one of the largest chambers of commerce in California. The Sacramento Area Commerce and Trade Organization is the chief organization that does marketing and recruitment. So they're, they're going to places like China and Germany to recruit companies to be here, and they're sort of our, our marketing arm. Uh, SARTA is the technology accelerator. They're helping the new businesses um, catalyze new technologies and, and create growth. And then my organization, Valley Vision, um, is really good at bringing people together and uh, focusing on how to do these big regional initiatives. Essentially, our job every day is to bring people and groups together to solve problems. And so that's sort of what we're here to do. And our role is, is sort of as the project manager with Christine Self and, and my own and some, several other folks uh, as part of the project team. So our key partners, higher education, utilities, workforce investment boards, businesses and their leaders, local government, organized labor, and many others. So we've done a lot to, at this point, reach out to a large number of stakeholders that have some sort of influence over this. The reason why higher education is uh, identified, it's flagged, is that we're in a, in a knowledge-based economy. And so in order for us to be uh, really sort of thinking about the next economy, we need to do it in close partnership with higher education. Um, Sac State, UC Davis, Los Rios Community College, uh, they're all our critical partners and they are working with us um, at the highest levels. Um, and that's really important to us. And it was sort of an early uh, effort that we made in order to make the next economy successful. Next Economy is, is funded from the grassroots, so it, it has um, uh, funding from a foundation um, actually based in Silicon Valley, and they challenged us. They said, we would be willing to give you $50,000 if your own business community came up with, with a matching dollar for dollar match. And their interest across the state is to try and encourage regions and civic leaders to come together to solve problems. So the Morgan Family Foundation is to be commended for that. We have, you can see uh, some government funding from uh, the Sacramento Employment and Training Agency to many banks and others. Uh, we've gone out and done this first round of funding and we're in the midst of doing more funding. The total budget is about $200,000 and that's to pay for the research that we need to do. And uh, because Valley Vision is set up to um, sort of do this work, part of the money is is to pay for Christine's salary and, and a portion of mine to do this work. So that's... Um, and we should call out, I recognize at least two of our funders here, there may be more, but I know two of them are present in the room, so Please. Sac State and California Forward, so thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> so, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, at least on this screen, you can see it a little bit better over there. So what, what are we trying to accomplish? There are six goals. So our, our primary focus is on increasing jobs and new investment. This coalition has come together to focus on how can we increase jobs and new investment in the Sacramento region. We want to create a set of regionally activated job growth and investment strategies. So, it, so next economy is a strategic planning process. What we're trying to do is create some overarching strategies um, and we'll talk more about uh, what, what those strategies are and how they're sort of evolving 
and the sort of health we need from you. Um, and we want to create new partnerships between different organizations in order to, to carry those out. And we want to make sure that they're deeply ingrained in the organizations that are uh, that we mentioned, not only the universities, but the workforce investment boards, and the business organizations uh, in order to carry that out. Item five there is, is, a, is a, another sort of important feature of Next Economy. Uh, there is something called a comprehensive economic development strategy, and <clears throat> it is a federal term that's existed for about 40 or 50 years. Cities have them, counties have them, and, um, and it's a way of, uh, of pursuing federal grant work um, in order to carry out different sort of local outcomes. In the Sacramento region, we found out that some cities have them, some cities don't. Some of their, their uh, economic development strategies are expiring. Uh, still others um, are um, about ready to start. So there's a sense that Next Economy can be a place where uh, we can create an, an umbrella comprehensive economic development strategy and then um, integrate that in at the city and county level. So we're working very closely with city managers and city planners and uh, county uh, uh, executives and others uh, doing uh, outreach um, to engage them. And there's, there's quite a bit of interest um, on their part as part of this process, because they're as committed as we are uh, to see jobs grow and so forth. Uh, this is the structure. So we have a leadership group, as I mentioned, Martha and Jim are part of this leadership group. Um, in, a, in a, I think the next slide, I'll, I'll describe who those are. There's a steering committee. The steering committee um, involves um, uh, 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 about 40 different people and organizations that span a very wide breadth of the community. And we have a strategy committee, and that strategy committee is, is bigger still. Um, and involves all segments of the community. It is open. Uh, Next Economy is an open process, so there is no um, uh, sort of a gatekeeper function where we're saying these are only the people that can craft this strategy. What, what we are endeavoring to do is to create a place where everybody can contribute, give us their ideas, and look for ways that, that they can activate it in their own communities. You can see the bubbles off the side those represent working groups, and we're in the process now of forming those work groups in order to carry out the strategy. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a moment. So here's our leadership group, that, that sort of uh, uh, the steering committee or um, uh, the, the, the co-chairs that are leading this. Uh, Mark Otero is a, a, a leader in uh, uh, the high-tech realm very successful. He tells a story about he can't find enough high-tech workers in the Sacramento region. And um, literally, he has a goal of, of uh, trying to grow his business from 75 to 80 employees to 200 by next year. And his challenge to us is, I want my business to grow here. I keep getting recruited to the Bay Area. What are you doing to sort of build the, the necessary workers here, train the necessary workers so that I can employ them instead of moving those jobs back to Silicon Valley. It's a very important message to say. Uh, Craig McNamara is, a, is a, uh, a renowned farmer. Susan Peters uh, was the chair of SACOG uh, last year. She's a business person, but also a county supervisor. She's providing great insights. Uh, Martha Lofgren, partner with uh, Brewer Lofgren, Jim Williams here, and also Bryce Harris. Bryce is the, uh, the Dean of Higher Education in the Sacramento region, um, in that he's the longest serving uh, higher education representative, and he is uh, helping guide Next Economy and providing that sort of education connection. So um, one important facet of Next Economy, and I'm going to breeze through this so that we can get to the panel, um, is that we're focused on a cluster-based economic strategy. And this is really critical because um, this is essentially um, the, the latest thinking um, on how to develop jobs and draw new investment, is to focus on clusters, not on industries, not on clusters. So let me describe what those are. Clusters are concentration 
of interconnected competing in complementary uh, uh, companies and suppliers across multiple industries. The way to think about it is the entire value chain. So um, we're not talking about um, uh, a particular manu type of manufacturer. What we're talking about is the manufacturer uh, reigned by all of the suppliers and all of their customers in sort of a, a value chain where the money comes in, they produce the goods, and, and the dollars go out. So we want to focus on that value chain. A lot of the value chain in some industries in the Sacramento region are here. They're wholly based here. Other parts of the value chain are here, and some of it is in India, and some of it is in other parts of the state, other parts of, of uh, the United States. To the extent that we can understand that better, and we can look for ways to bring more of that value chain here, um, or help grow the value chain so that those companies can be successful, then we'll have the best time of, or the best chance of, of growing additional jobs here. So there are economic cluster attributes that are really important. Uh, they have to have a strong presence of economic base activities. That deserves just a brief mention. Um, economic base activities are those sorts of jobs that, that have a high multiplier effect, that they, they create additional jobs. So rather than circulating the dollars in the region, uh, like retail industries often do, what we're trying to focus on are those base industries that help those retail industries uh, grow by supporting uh, their growth. So um, you can read all of that. I'm going to try and speed through this just a little bit. They're also locational, so it's very helpful, obviously, if you have prominent companies here that sort of underpin the fact that, that, uh, uh, that you have a particular cluster in the Sacramento area. I'm about to tell you that we have a cluster around healthcare and life sciences in the Sacramento region, and we have some amazing companies uh, like Sutter Health and Kaiser and Mercy and uh, UC Davis Health System and a host of other um, institutions that are arrayed around them, and that helps us with, with um, sort of focusing on job growth in those areas. This is almost impossible to see. But uh, I'm going to uh, jump to the point. We have identified through our economic research done through the research arm of SACTO, um, the clusters that are in, uh, that are sort of rising right now in the Sacramento region that have a high sort of uh, uh, value add to our region. They're agriculture and food, advanced manufacturing, information and communications technology, and life sciences and health services. So part of Next Economy's goal is to diversify our economy. Right now, it's highly concentrated um, in a good way, um, uh, in some sense, in construction and, and also in government. Uh, but what we recognize is that those two industries have been the, the hardest hit in the most recent recession. And so um, in reaching out to uh, the, uh, uh, in, in developing the clusters in these other areas, um, we think that um, we're going to be able to create additional jobs, additional wealth, and it's going to provide the support necessary to the, the building industry to meet those, those needs in the ways that, that the Sustainable Communities Initiative and the Metropolitan Transportation Plan contemplate. So we're at the point now where we're forming these work groups. And again, this is an open process. If you're interested in participating, see me or Christine or, or uh, uh, any one of our leadership team members about this. But essentially, we're looking deeply into uh, the, the, the research around these particular clusters that I just named. We're inventorying the assets around them, uh, looking at what are the things that we can capitalize on, what are the things that are, are impeding their growth in the Sacramento area, and developing a set of strategies in order to carry that out. We intend to do this all. We just started last year within a year's time because frankly, I think it was uh, Martha and I, um, and probably Barbara Hayes and Meg, uh, we were all here in this room and we were giving a presentation to the State Cog Board 
they told us that we better hurry up about it. They told uh, the business community that it was really, really important to get on this and make sure that we didn't that we we did our research and we made sure that we were making informed decisions, but not wait too long because the need was so high. So we've taken that to uh, to heart. And we're working very hard to be able to, to uh, deliver uh, the promise of Next Economy, which is bringing as many people to the table as possible, um, engaging them in a conversation about uh, the economy of the future, look for ways that we can focus in on those, those clusters of, of uh, economic activity that have the most hope for job creation and wealth creation, and, and then turn us all loose so that we can go work on developing those things, but um, benefiting from a process where we have some regional focus on, on what those things are that we ought to be focusing on. Uh, this is uh, this is sort of breaking down next economy in great depth, but it sort of gives you a sense that we're doing research. We're just about done with that. Those those letters at the top are the, the, the dates of the month. We've got a steering committee uh, and strategy meetings. Uh, I think what I want to just sort of say here is that there is a strategy meeting coming up, and it's, I believe if you picked up the handout, it's coming up February 17th. It's, uh, we're, we're circulating these around the region so that uh, we hopefully capitalize on, on people's availability. The next one is in Folsom, uh, at the Folsom Community Center um, on February 17th, a Friday. So um, you'll be able to hear more about the, the research, the latest news, and also about some of the, uh, the emerging work of the work groups. Um, there is a, still another regional forum that's set for May 4th, and it's, it's meant to be uh, uh, sort of this bridge between once we have the strategies together to really sort of get the, the work groups um, activated so that we're taking action to carry this out. And if you're interested in finding out more, uh, that's the, uh, uh, that is the, the website address. So with that, I'm going to pause. Are there any immediate questions before I turn to the panel? Okay. I know, I know. We've been chatting at you for a long time. I, I guess the general question, I mean, being aware of the green light that you're sure it does, it, 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 in that process, you, you cross over and information and sharing is going on through the process. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, uh, one of the things I failed to mention, and I'm glad you, you asked the question, is that um, one of our economic clusters uh, beyond the four is that we've got a, a growing clean technology sector here. Uh, it existed and we knew about it and have known about it for several years now in Greenwise Joint Venture and also an earlier effort called the Green Capital Alliance have been working on this for the last five years. So we feel like, okay, we don't need a strategy. We've got everybody at the table. We've got organizations like SMUD and in Sac State and, and our business community, they're already working together. Um, and so a lot of what Next Economy will do will reference that work, will align with that work, but we're not going to duplicate it because there's already great stuff going on there. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to transition. I'm going to sit down here and uh, uh, go next to uh, ask uh, uh, Martha, sort of the first question, and I'm going to each ask each one of them a question. Uh, they'll respond for three, four, five minutes, um, and we just hope to uh, use that to key off. And then um, I'll entertain your questions, or you can direct them uh, uh, directly to them. Okay. So, Martha, I, I think the question I have for you is: as we think about next economy, and it's a regional strategy, and a lot of what I just shared is sort of at the 60,000 foot level. Um, at the end of the day, this needs to come down to how is it going to be carried out literally on the ground. So could you talk a little bit about how the next economy impacts place? Hopefully I'll remember to keep this button pushed down while I'm talking, so if I forget, somebody has to wave their hands around. Um, so Bill prompted each of us on our, or prepped us on our questions beforehand, and I, I have to say as a lawyer when I read, you know, how does it impact place, I'm very literal, and so I was like, okay, how do I really answer that? 
And I guess the best way for me is to give two examples, one a little more historical based on my experience working and living in Folsom, and one moving forward a little bit, which I think both are good examples of what the cluster analysis will help us do. You saw our four areas of emphasis, and one of them is information technology and communication technology. In the city of Folsom, you all know that Intel um, has a very big um, employment base in the city of Folsom. Well, as a, as a result of what's happened with Intel, there have been several spin-off IT businesses, some large, some small. Uh, many of the employees of Intel who were most successful have left Intel to form those businesses and have, in some cases, used venture capital in order to do that. And it's a very good example of how you can have a relatively large employer um, that can serve as the base for the spin-off businesses that then come around it and in reality, how that one large employer will help define the place in a community or the sense of place in the community. Because certainly Folsom, I think, is regarded as having a, a relatively high um, income level, relatively high education level. When I was city manager, I was aware of the statistics, but it was something over 70% had a college degree that lived in the city of Folsom. So um, that type of an employer is going to affect who lives within the city. Comparison more in, in current time and, and reflecting on the initial presentation about wanting to have job growth in the um, downtown corridor area, we have UC Davis Med Center, which is doing a lot of research into stem cell. And um, you've seen also that the um, healthcare bioscience is one of our clusters that we'll be focusing on. And about three or four months ago, there was an announcement about a Chinese um, firm that just genetic research coming to locate right near the UC Davis Med Center. I believe if memory is correct, it's gonna create about 200 jobs, so it's not that we're in the thousands as a result of that one, but 200 jobs is a lot um, in our region, and certainly one of, um, one of the businesses that will be larger in the sense of scope in that um, downtown, not downtown, but Alhambra, Stockton Boulevard area. And certainly that will help rev revitalize an area that needs some revitalization. It will help stimulate some of the um, economic growth around that area and will provide a lot of ancillary jobs in a, a variety of levels. So I think that's another example of how the economic clusters can help develop a, a core business growth. In terms of the sense of place, I think that will always rely a bit on the community that's involved. And one of the things that we're hoping to see happen out of Next Economy is that the um, region will focus on an economic development strategy and we won't have the city of Folsom, the city of West Sacramento, the city of Sacramento, the city of Elk Grove, the city of Davis, each working on competing with one another about bringing the same business into the region. But our economic strategy will help identify region-wide strengths and region-wide benefits. One of the reasons that we're checking in with the SACOG board is to hope that at some point, we'll get some regional consensus on what our economic development strategy should be. So I guess the last point I'd like to leave you with on the sense of place is that it should be broader than just what one local community wants, but what would benefit our entire six county region. Uh, thanks, Martha. So I'm gonna to turn to Jim next. So uh, to what degree does um, having the necessary transportation infrastructure and other sort of planning done uh, make a difference when a business is making a decision as to whether to locate or um, uh, expand where they are today? I think if you look at history, the very birth of cities came about where, where convenient transportation that could facilitate human interaction and trade um, existed in the early days. It was, it was at seaports and rivers and the intersection of, of land travel routes. Um, it's still somewhat that way today, although the number of opportunities have, have expanded. Um, what with air travel, trains, and other other things have been forces in shaping the, the development of the cities, but also the economies that, that can take place in them. Um, so, number one, that kind of connection to the world in terms of transportation is, is really uh, of, of paramount importance in, in the success of businesses, particularly what you were referring to as base, uh, 
uh, industries or base uh, businesses that have a market that far exceeds their local their local market share. I think um, that relates to the ability to move product, move goods out of the region, move, bring inputs into the region, and that has to be facilitated easily. Um, but as important, and we're seeing it more, you'll see uh, the opportunity for personal mobility, mobility to go from one part of the, of the community to another in mobility for people to be able to change jobs um, when those opportunities arise so that they can have some ability to advance in their careers. We see a lot of need for mobility and the fact that we have so many uh, multiple income households where the, the jobs may be dispersed in different parts of the region. So the ability for people to be able to move around to get from their um, location where they live to the, to the opportunities for work is, is a critical element as well. And I think, um, obviously, the ability to access commerce within your region is, is critical. And you know we've done a number of projects through Valley Vision that identified that there are pockets where, particularly in lower income, that if they don't have the proper transit, they can't even access the grocery store in, in some cases. So um, in order to, to create wealth and be able to have a vital marketplace, people need to be, have multiple options about how they can get back and forth. And I think um, there are several growing trends, and it's, it's ones that we need to be aware of in, this, in the Sacramento region particularly. Number one is, uh, you know, the example one of our leadership group is Marco Otero. And uh, at a forum we had in West Sacramento last fall, somebody brought up the question, well, we don't have any manufacturing going on in, in growth in that in, in the Sacramento area. And he, he says, I beg to differ, you know, he says, I'm a, I'm a manufacturer. I manufacture games and I ship them all around the world digitally. And so our communications infrastructure is really, we gotta put that almost in the classification of transportation now because so much of um, what we do, we do um, via the, um, the digital medium. My company now is, has a number of projects in China and there's two elements of that that have become really critical. One of them is that digital connectedness you know, to where we can have, we've had, we have had meetings um, on through the uh, internet between ourselves and clients there. And then secondly, an area where we need to strengthen is, is our access to air travel and particularly convenient air travel. And, <coughs> excuse me, particularly connectedness between our communities and those alternative forms of transportation. So all of that is what facilitates um, commerce. The ability to have mobility and to have the sense of place is what can attract people to the region because if people feel like they're trapped in one job or one location, then it's a less desirable location for them because people want to know that they have fallback multiple opportunities when they go out to seek, seek uh, employment opportunities. So that's another critical aspect of it. Uh, thanks, Jim. So, Bill, uh, Bill could I yeah. interject an example sure. there? Um, Intel, when it made the decision to locate in Folsom, one of its preconditions was the construction of the Prairie City Road interchange on Highway 50. Um, so transportation infrastructure absolutely matters in the economic development realm, and the state of California cooperated heavily in making that happen. Um, SACOG did as well, so I think it's a, a good example of it. Absolutely. Okay, so Christine, uh, last question, and then we'll open it up to your questions uh, to the panel. Um, so if people were interested in um, sustainable communities and specifically in the transit priority areas, the five that, that have been identified, um, and wanted to see that sort of carried out through Next Economy, um, how could they get involved? Well, I think there's a couple of ways um, for engagement that we've built into the process. Um, obvious ones are that we're just establishing work groups um, at the moment around four priority cluster areas, the advanced manufacturing and information technology and those four that, that Bill had outlined. Um, so if there's interest in wanting to participate in the brainstorming and the formation of um, actions and strategies around those clusters, um, anyone is welcome to participate and we invite you to do that. Um, I would say that meetings are probably going to start to be scheduled in the week ahead and in the coming weeks. 
and there'll probably be a few meetings um, that occur within those work group areas to, um, like Bill said, assess the opportunities, define the impediments, and then ultimately to look at what are the best and most effective strategies to grow jobs and create wealth in the region. And those work groups will be working to do the, to do all that. Um, the other is the regional forums that um, have also been mentioned. The first coming up next is the, uh, the February 17th event in Folsom and then a follow-up follow one in May. Um, but I think longer term, in terms of your question specifically to transportation infrastructure, um, I believe that we have recognized very early on that the next economy effort is focused specifically on growing jobs, but we recognize that that can't happen without uh, the byproduct of civic and, uh, civic and transportation and infrastructure and techno technological infrastructure to help those strategies actually be successful. And so while I can't comment right now on the specifics of what that might look like, I can say that it's, it's fair to say that there will be some sort of byproduct in that realm of, of um, building out transportation, particularly in the advanced manufacturing and farming um, and food agriculture, uh, food sections, um, segments. Um, most, most um, as they rise to the top in my mind is um, opportunities for that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, is to go back to the comprehensive economic development strategy that Bill mentioned, the SEDS and that we were very forward thinking and purposeful in wanting to make that one of our outlining objectives within the next economy strategy because we recognize that the civic and transportation infrastructure that might be required to carry out some of the strategies will require funding. And there's opportunity with the federal level for grant, for grant money um, at, that, at that civic infrastructure level. And so we are purposefully identifying or making sure that we meet the requirements of that sense at a regional at a regional level so that we have that opportunity. Okay. So uh, this is a point where we're hoping that you will have questions. If you have questions or if you have comments that you'd like to make about um, the effort, um, uh, I would just... Uh, we have many. Okay, so I'm going to start in the way back, and then we'll we'll come forward. So, sir, if you could, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, your name and your organization that might help us in uh, response. Sure, uh, Bob Lagomarsino with URS Corporation. And I'm on the board of directors with CADA, Capillary Development Authority. I, I wanted to seize upon a couple of the references to Mark Otero, and first was his, I guess, the consternation about the the lack of high-tech high tech employees available in the marketplace here. Uh, that's correct, yeah, that's I, what he's told us. I'm, I'm curious as to, and, and obviously because I represent um, downtown, midtown, in my uh, appointed capacity, we're always curious about, about the dynamics and the, sort of the demographics that drive demand for different things. Um, is, is he ha has he had trouble recruiting people here, or is it just a function of his not being able to tap into, into people who are already here? And, and I'll make an additional comment, just kind of longitudinally. Uh, I, I know back in the, in the 80s, there was a big influx of people from the Silicon Valley, and Martha mentioned some of the high-tech employment in Folsom, and certainly Jim would know in South Placer County. Um, it seems to me that, that now that we have this the creative class. We have this economy um, that is led or at some level driven by people who are interested in different things, who don't want to live in El Dorado County or South Placer County, who might be interested in the quality of life that, that I think is now really available in Midtown and Downtown and some of the peripheral uh, neighborhoods. So I, I, I guess getting back to Mr. Otero's comments, and he, by the way, was a Cata tenant when he started Click Nation and got going, so we'll take some credit for that. Um, I, I think we can do a better job of attracting people based on the quality of life that has emerged in, in some of the neighborhoods in Midtown and Downtown, so curious as to what your observations are there. Mark has made the very specific point that he purposely located in Midtown because it has the kind of environment that is attractive to the particular age cohort that he's looking for, because not only is he looking for people that are skilled in that high tech, because he develops online games, 
it tends to be a younger cohort that wants a different, you know, that, that kind of lifestyle. So he purposely is located there. Um, he, he has retained his independence here thus far because he has found, whereas he may have to work a little harder to, retract, to attract people, he has a much higher retention rate because uh, he refers to workers in the Silicon Valley and the Bay Area as promiscuous. <laughs> and, you know, uh, job uh, employer prom promiscuity is rampant. <laughs> and so uh, he, he, he's found that because of the cost of, of, of hiring and, uh, and training people, the, the higher the retention rate, the better off he is in, in doing it. So that's, that's one of the things he does cite, and he does cite Midtown in its sense of place as um, a, a, a big part of that. So, but that's a particular age cohort that is more attracted to that. And, and in the past, the, the advantage that we had in the region for the Folsom's and the South Class was attracting the older family, people that wanted to put down roots that were concerned about schools and their ability to, to live the lifestyle they want. So I think the region can benefit from developing all of these alternatives and particularly um, those lifestyle those lifestyle options that are attracted to um, the emerging creative class, I think we want to call it that one. Um, I'd like to add on to that that uh, I think there's a number of factors that Mark has cited, and, and it's true that he feels he's, he's decided to be here, he wants to be here, and he feels that there's a very loyal and talented pool of, of workers available to him, but that he's growing his company at such a quick fast trajectory that there isn't enough um, to draw on and that he does have to recruit uh, the majority of his of his employment base from outside the region. Part of that other um, another aspect of it is that Sacramento isn't yet quite known for being a creative community like Silicon Valley or San Francisco have become known as. And so when somebody graduates in the field that he's searching for, they're not inclined to locate here or to stay here if they graduate from here. So there's that aspect. And then the third being that um, technology, the technology field is moving so quickly that it's very difficult for the education community to keep up with preparing the students for the jobs that are available. So you combine those three factors and, um, and Mark finds himself needing to find a talent pool that just doesn't exist or is read not readily available. Thank you, one, one more comment. And was, Jim, you made an observation about air travel and now I'm speaking with my work hat on. There's, there's also a high-speed train project that we need to promote. Okay, so we're gonna stay in the back and keep coming forward, so uh, V. Governor. Yes, please. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is V. Governor. I'm a community scholar with the University of California at Davis. Um, work closely with um, Dr. Jonathan London and Chris Bennett um, on our report to UV at SACOG. I want to commend Mr. Uh, Jim Williams for recognizing that our effort is to develop sustainable, equitable, and livable communities. So as we give cluster development the focus, we must give attention to those issues where transportation interfaces uh, these communities that are disenfranchised. And indeed all of us, even you, um, that can also be a consideration to encourage in those disenfranchised communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Burton. I'm a uh, bike representative on the Dry Creek Parkway Committee. Um, and the obvious question that occurs to me is time frame, which is just because you didn't mention it. And uh, for example, you could say that the King's effort for a new stadium might be the panic time frame. And uh, so that's my viewpoint of that. And may not be sustainable. Certainly, sports is sustainable. But so. Uh, uh, and it would seem the logical answer would be it lines up very closely with the SACOG planning horizon. Um, certainly you want to develop a cluster over a period of five to ten year increments. And, uh, and you'd like to have it be a vision for long term, not only for us, but for our kids as well. Um, any further comments? 
comments on that? Maybe I could start off with that one. Um, and to talk a little bit about how we plan to implement this. I, I think we do anticipate a multi-year time frame. The gentleman who's actually doing the research is not here with us, Ryan Sharp. He works um, through a research organization with SACTO. Um, and he would give us a very precise answer, but I anticipate it will be something along the lines of a three to five year time frame for our first phase. Um, but equally important is who's going to be responsible for implementing it. And you heard reference to four nonprofits coming together to start this program, SACTO, the Metro Chamber, Valley Vision, and, and SARTA. And there are other nonprofit economic development organizations in the region, Greenwise Joint Venture being one um, that's about to, to get its own legs. And we plan to have um, identified who will be the implementing organization with respect to each of our economic development strategies. And then the volunteer board leadership, of which I am one, plan to hold our organizations accountable, the CEOs, like Bill Mueller, to say, okay, Bill, we identified two or three things that Valley Vision was responsible for in 2013. We want to make sure those are part of the Valley Vision work plan. So we're looking not only at a multi-year time frame, but multi-organization implementation. Can I, can, I, can I just add though that in terms of getting the, the project conceived and ready to implement, we purposely had a very tight time frame on it um, because of the gravity of the situation that we're facing right now in terms of employment. So there, there was a sense of urgency and there is a sense of urgency to get the SEDS done and to get this strategy um, out for implementation. Brief follow up. Eating effect um, uh, and, and be able to create a lot of wealth and value creation. So yes, we've, we've got smart people advising us that that um, the cluster approach is the way to do it. I believe it based on, on that data. And um, there's a high value add and multiplier effect, so it, it has this cascading effect across the region. And it will be more resilient, more sustainable, so that, that we're not seeing these huge spikes that have occurred that have created so much pain and suffering in the region. So. So it is uh, very much, um, you know, a an effort at trying something a little bit different. We've never tried, in, in, to my knowledge. I've been working in the Sacramento region in a variety of roles for the last 25 years, um, and and I've not seen the region take a regional cluster approach um, and been as dedicated as this before. So I'm I'm hopeful, but we're also very sober, and that's why. It has to take all of us. It, it's going to be all of us working together to find our part in it and joining together and working jointly to carry it out. Well, the, the reason for my question and the, the background behind this, I'm from the Bay Area originally, and worked out in offices in the Bay Area in San Diego and see some of the signs of recovery. And uh, you're not seeing that here, but you, you, you do know there's money here. One of the one of the advantages of, of that the Bay Area has is um, they are the, the seat of the world for information technology, and uh, it's a massive wealth creator. So um, uh, there's not a lot of uh, in, in some industries there's not a lot of investment cost, but there's a huge amount of value that can be created. And they're at the epicenter of it for the world, and um, and they have a very dynamic cluster that that is has the value chain a lot of it there, but it's also connected all over the world. That's where a lot of their their success. If you're to take that out of the economy, um, they're they're grappling with uh, huge government uh, deficits at the city and county level. I, I speak to my peers there about the challenges that they face on the ground. So. Um, in some ways, they're, they're dealing with the same issues, but they're even more acute in the Bay Area. Yeah, um, if I missed this when I went to see the meteor, I apologize. But um, in the uh, priority cluster areas, um, today you've only talked about four, and I know that we had originally talked about the fifth that's on our sheet here, education and knowledge creation. So, 
Oh, it's on the list. It's, it's especially on the list because you're here. <laughs> Christine, did you want to talk about how that is showing up in our work? Um, yeah, so um, the research um, using a screen of about 14 different indicators identified um, seven areas of opportunity. The four clusters that have been discussed today are the ones that we want to focus on in the immediate term. We recognize that we cannot our bandwidth and um, and the timeline require that we get narrow and focused. And so so there are four areas where we're going to build work groups around right now to do immediate work and, and identify opportunity strategies. There are three others. Um, clean technology is one of them. We recognize that there's a lot of work already being done in that area with the work of uh, Green Voice Joint Venture and Capital Green Alliance, and that there's really not a need for us to develop a work group around that because activities are in play and, um, and it would be duplicative or redundant. So we're gonna let that area take, the, I mean, move on its own, it's in, in its own momentum. The other two are um, business and financial information services or business financial services, am I saying that right? Invest, um, and so, um, and then the and then the seventh being um, in, um, the education cluster. As we looked at the at the clusters closely, we recognized that those last two are really cross cutting. They're not they're not verticals. They're horizontals, and that they can affect everything across the other four clusters that we're looking at. So we're not taking them off the table. We're putting them in a holding pattern for the moment. So when the um, work groups identify what they are going to bring forward as their primary recommendations for catalytic strategies, we then can go back to the education um, area, the education cluster, and the financial and business services and look at what are the activities that we need to employ there that are going to help those strategies be successful. So it's just a basically a phased approach at this point. And, and Bernadette, to add on to that, um, we had a bit of a debate at our leadership team on, on do we leave out one of these clusters? What are the questions that we're going to get? And I personally hope that, that those of you who might have an interest in some of these clusters that are not in the initial first phase of discussion for work groups, that you find a work group that you're interested in and go and talk about the education and workforce needs. For example, what you see as the role of public institution, how we can support public institutions and private institutions of, of higher education, because we need to keep that debate going. And it's not our intention to say that it's being left behind. It's just we only have so many people to do so many meetings. So please still attend a work group meeting, whatever other subject matter of interest and raise your particular issue. Um, so I'm going to turn to uh, Trish, and then if we have time, yes. I just have to bring up. I agree with everyone. The people who talked about those that are uh, the absolute non-represented that usually almost get the table, and that's the the poor and the working class. So when we talk about the next economy capital region, we still have to remember that you know those those statistics that talk about how many people are in public assistance, how many people live in poverty, and, and then what are we doing when we talk about those overall goals that we're gonna raise that level, that that's part of the equation, that when we talk about increasing wealth, that we talk about, wait a minute, we need to say, you know, one in three kids in Sac City Unified is not gonna graduate. We need to look at those things that say, what are we doing that helps those totally unrepresented folks, if you will, when, when we're at the table. The other thing I would bring up is, is when we talk about the economy and, and the transportation, that what I do find is that most people who are making the decisions about these things have not ridden a bus in 25 years, or RT, or they have not been on public transportation. And I think it would be almost wonderful if we started having a, a kind of a pledge at the top of the page that when you got your agenda for the meeting that I pledge to take some sort of public transportation before the next meeting because it really is a huge issue when we talk about getting a good workforce, how do we get them there when we stop our buses at 530 
and we want a thriving economy that goes till seven or eight, especially for those unrepresented folks, because those are the people that tend to need that public transportation. So I really think that the leadership has to be involved in the transportation by getting on it once in a while, would be nice. I just think that they should get a badge, to be honest. I, you know, if you if everybody that has a development plan need that we say you've got to have public transportation be part of that. Okay, I want you to get on a bus and ride it before you get here the next time you come before us for approval. I mean, I think those are things that are important, and we need to put our money where our mouth is. If we're going to spend all this money on a transportation plan, we should at least use it. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, One of the reasons we have Chancellor Harris on our leadership team is to make sure that the community college system is actively engaged in the workforce development. And that's probably one of the first places to reach the population that you're talking about as far as what's, you know, we're not gonna take on making sure everybody graduates from high school, but that's obviously a, a basic problem that we need to deal with. But once students graduate from high school, and can at least have access to basic community college training and, and get training for some of the jobs that don't require a bachelor's degree or some kind of a master's degree or professional training. That's why, that's why I used UC Davis as one of the examples of, of the cluster analysis, the medical center and the, the uh, genetic firm from, from China because, because frankly, I think there will be a lot of growth in the, well, and again, we can't, we can't solve every related issue, um, but we are absolutely not focusing on job growth in the peripheral areas of, of the region. We are, we are looking region-wide, and there's no predisposition to having the job growth outside the downtown, midtown area at all. Yeah, and if I could add on to that, I think uh, you have in one of the clusters ag and food, and so you have a uh, essentially a, a rural economic development strategy that, that ties into the uh, immense work that the Council of Governments has done through the Rural Urban Connection Strategy. They have paved the way in developing planning tools and uh, developing essentially a, uh, ways to advance um, uh, economic development in rural areas. It has been their focus for the last two years. Um, what we hope Next Economy will focus on is with UC Davis's strength in uh, environmental sciences and agricultural sciences that we'll see technology transfer and other sorts of, of activities that can create jobs in places like Winters and in, in some of the more rural areas because we know that that will serve those communities because they're equally deserving of job growth um, in places like Yuba City and others as in downtown. So we have an agricultural strategy, a high-tech strategy that is fairly spatially distributed um, in places like uh, Placer, El Dorado, and so forth. Agricultural strategy that has, um, uh, that exists in El Dorado County with its 
It's uh, wine grape uh, Appalachia and, and other things that are going on there, uh, as well as some of the other aspects of the uh, of, of the clusters. Um, there's clearly more to do, but um, there has been sort of a conscious effort to try and look at a, a non-urban uh, 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 bias, nor a rural bias, but something that, that covers the unique aspects of the region. Yes, sir. Uh, Paul Ainger, I'm uh, with Sacramento Mutual Housing Association. I'm a poor small developer of affordable housing. Uh, and, but I'm actually talking as a board member of the California Reinvestment Coalition because of the interna internationalization of banking, financial services, where it is more difficult for affordable housing developers to get investment in, in uh, debt capital from the banks that they, we used to deal with, like Bank of America, which is long gone, we used to do a lot of, a lot of lending in the uh, Sacramento area. Now it's not even uh, on their radar screen, so they don't know these communities. A lot of the financial institutions that used to serve us are now not no longer interested. So it was interesting when we talked to Robo Bank, because Robo Bank's trying to fill that gap. They said, well, the biggest problem we have is disinvestment in the rural community that we serve. We're less likely to really want to really invest in a lot of these areas until the government and other sources step up their investment here because there's really not the infrastructure here. So it's kind of a, an interesting sort observation of that, I think we ought to, that you need to consider in, your, uh, in the next economy. Thank you. Thank you. Pete? I um, actually live in the Bay Area and moved up there after our classes at uh, UC Davis and uh, live with public transport. Uh, it's amazing, people can get from San Jose all the way up to uh, Richmond pretty easily. Here for someone to get from West Sacramento to Folsom, you can tell me what that problem is like. And something that we also found out at UC Davis was that none of the transportation systems that went to a connected you cannot use an RT pass in West Sacramento. You cannot use an RT pass in Folsom. So just to get from Oak Park to Folsom, you probably would spend about fifteen dollars each way, and about three hours. Thank you. I, I know our our CCAR friends are noting that as well. So. Um, Fifteen dollars may be an exaggeration, but the price of candy is not too much. Yeah. Right. Well, we are. Okay. Uh, sorry. I, I, I don't see any transportation staff readily available here in the room to from SACOD to answer that question. But I would like to speak to the fact that we are working on a universal fare card project that would improve the integration of schedule, service, and fee structure for passengers to facilitate that because as a region with an elected board, we very much recognize that our region's travel demands are not bound by jurisdictional boundaries or service boundaries for those transit districts. But I appreciate you bringing up the comment today. Absolutely, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Eric Wright, I'm with Yellow County Transportation District. And uh, Martha, you commented about uh, the creation of a regional economic plan uh, which would keep agencies and jurisdictions from competing uh, against each other to uh, bring businesses to different areas uh, within the region. Um, however, I've seen these kind of regional plans be really great on paper um, and not work so well um, when they go to be implemented without two very necessary things, one being uh, a carrot and one being a stick. And I wanted to pick your guys' brains on uh, what kind of carrots and sticks you have for a regional plan to keep jurisdictions from fighting over much needed uh, money in, within their cities and within their counties. I really wish you had an, uh, a hard question for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one um, carrot that we hope to have is if we are successful and we have this comprehensive economic development strategy, the SEDS, it will make us more competitive for federal economic development grant money. 
And so if a jurisdiction follows the Regional Economic Development Plan, the theory would be that they would be more competitive at bringing federal grant dollars for economic development to their jurisdiction. So that's a nice theory, um, but that's, that's a possibility. We have not, we're, we're focused very much right now on getting this economic development strategy, strategy completed by the summer, which is a very large task to accomplish. And I think after that, um, there will be more discussion about how do we implement it and how do we come up with incentives. And we have Blueprint as a model. I do land use work as a lawyer, and I'm very keenly aware that every time there's a land use project that goes through, the question is asked, does this comply with Blueprint? Because we know if it doesn't, Mike McCuber's going to write a letter, and we're going to have to deal with the fact that it, the land use plan doesn't comply with Blueprint. Now, will we get to that point where our economic development strategy has that degree of, of weight in the region? I don't know. Um, I think some of us hope that it will, but we certainly have a model to work after. And I, I think that will be phase two, assuming we get through phase one. I also, you know, over, over the years, what I've observed is that most of the competition or the unhealthy competition you see is um, for the, the kind of retail dollars that, that local jurisdictions get to respend. Number one, our focus isn't on that kind of economic development. And then secondly, you know, the, the model that has existed, particularly for attraction of businesses from outside the area that SACTO works with, I think has worked. There, there will still be competition between jurisdictions to attract any potential user, but it's a more of a healthy competition of who can put the best package together that will win it for the region. So it's the nature of the competition that I think we gotta look at rather than the fact that, that it's there. Um, there's one that makes us stronger and one that's just a, a zero sum game of poaching from each other. So I'm scanning the room and seeing no questions and Joe walking up. I think we're done. Thank you very much. I really want to thank our panelists today for, for sharing this uh, project with us and, and getting your input on uh, the next phases as, as we move ahead on both projects in our work here in SACOG. So round of applause for this. And we, we are collecting a lot of issues. This is a part of this. HUD grant project. There was a survey um, handed out in the front here, so if, if you fill that out, please uh, turn it in to Eric uh, Johnson, who's with us in the on staff uh, after the meeting. But as I, I said, we, we are uncovering a lot of issues, and, and this is good because we, we are integrating further studies into our planning processes and, and, and hearing your, your input on these, and, and so I, I think this has really been a, a great session today. So thank you for your time.